This video is going to be uh, the second in a series on invertebrate uh, diversity, just going through various groups of invertebrates with a few comments on each. Obviously, as the videos in this uh, playlist play in the background, um, these go into the topics in a little more detail. So if anything interested you uh, further, obviously you could watch the individual videos as well. Now, I apologize for how this is going to uh, start. And the people, the other biology instructors that I work with, uh, they know that this is a bad topic because um, I, more than anyone else that I know, um, gets angry with the classification of worms. So uh, I'm old. And so when I uh, studied biology, this was how invertebrates were classified. You had the sponges, uh, which were the most, uh, which were classified as the earliest branch of animals in the most primitive. They are multicellular, but they lack tissue. They don't even have tissues. They're the most primitive. Jellyfish and corals, they have tissues, but they don't have organs. They don't have a brain. So they are the next most primitive branch. And then when we look at uh, these, uh, earlier, uh, the classification was, uh, we have a number of uh, flatworms, like the seals, which we'll get to, uh, and the flatworms, which were what I ended the previous video uh, with. Um, and they were primitive because uh, they're flat. I mean, they don't have segments. Their mouth is still in the center of their body like a, um, uh, like a jellyfish. Uh, they have an incomplete digestive tract with only one uh, opening. They don't have a circulatory system. They don't have a heart, uh, etc. So we could give a whole reason why they're primitive. Nematodes are, uh, were a little more uh, complex. They didn't have a true uh, coelom. Um, they don't have a circulatory system, um, but then you would get to the higher animals, which were called coelomates that have a body cavity. Um, most had segments or like with the mollusks, the first mollusks had segments, uh, they had hearts, um, et cetera. And so anatomically, one could support this classification of, uh, of life. And remember that uh, when we uh, study biological groups, we want it to be a real group that reflects the history of these um, uh, organisms. Uh, and then also then is supported by the evidence. So if you say, are there uh, traits which the group share, there are. Now, um, as years progressed, it became possible to not only study um, organisms using uh, anatomy and anatomical traits, um, but now also with uh, genetics and use genetic traits. Um, now, it sometimes happens that the tree that one would uh, develop with uh, uh, anatomical traits, so like here's the patterning that I see, is then different from the, um, uh, the pattern that one would see studying the genetic traits. So now here's a problem. So first of all, this is good. Like I, I'm angry, I'm frustrated. Um, but this is actually exactly as it should be. So science... Um, is not this idea that you know we get to this knowledge and we now know everything, pass this on to the next generation, we're done studying the natural world. Science always begins with the precursor. You know what, we might be wrong. We might not understand things as well as we uh, should. We should always be prepared um, to ask a new question. Is that really, you know, the conclusion which we did have, is that really the way it is? Does the evidence really support that? This new way of testing something, does that support the old way? Do we have to revise our ideas? Um, and so that's what science, scientists know that some of what we think is true is actually false. It's wrong. And we need to correct that. And that is how our understanding of the natural world keeps getting better. In the Middle Ages, they thought they knew everything or that everything they thought they knew was actually correct. And as a result, they just pass on errors um, year after year. And science didn't advance. They didn't get better because we're constantly looking for errors and willing to accept that you know, some of what we think is true might actually be wrong and we have to then revise our thinking. That allows us to get better. So this is actually one of the strengths of science, but it's actually frustrating uh, for teachers and for students. You wanna know the answers and you know, saying, well, we're not sure the evidence supports this, but you know, new studies might support this and here's evidence pro and con. That's frustrating, but nevertheless, that is you know, an essence of, of science. Um, and that is how we advance. So getting back to this. So the genetic evidence, when we compare sequences, this supports where those acyl flatworms are still the most primitive, what we call bilaterian, which are bilaterally symmetrical. 
um, rather than rather than radially symmetrical like a jellyfish. Um, but now um, there are these new groups which would include Lophotrochozoa, um, and this includes things like brachiopods, annelids, mollusks, uh, number team worms, and flatworms. Flatworms, which used to be down here, are now uh, up here. And then ecdysozoans, um, uh, which would include nematodes and arthropods. Nematodes used to be down here. Now, while there, you could name some anatomical traits, like, for example, nematodes and arthropods both molt, I'm sorry, both molt, um, and that's what ecdysozoan, the name, refers to. So you could come up with anatomical traits which uh, unite uh, uh, them, but it's primarily on genetic uh, comparison. So some of the tree is uh, the same. And so now what was once called one group of flatworms is now split into two groups of flatworms. There still are some flatworms, not very well known, and not the most common flatworms, uh, which are the most primitive phyletarian. So in other words, in between, say, jellyfish and all other uh, bilaterally, uh, and then other bilaterally symmetrical animals. So this is still, um, a, a primitive group. But the other flatworms, things like planaria, tapeworms, and flukes, they were then moved um, and uh, uh, they are put together with mollusks and annelids. This video will then go through some of uh, their primitive features, derived features, and features which vary. That's also a tricky thing because if um, you're classifying a group based on its features, what happens, like when you take um, for example, snakes. Snakes evolved from ancestors which had legs. And so if you have a group called tetrapoda, which literally means having four legs, um, what happens if some of them have subsequently lost their legs? Um, so uh, some of the traits uh, vary. So um, what you know, is, seems to be the correct path is that uh, we simply revise our classification uh, and say, you know, the one that I you know, grew up learning it as a, you know, biology student that seemed not to be the correct, and now we have this new way of analyzing stuff. Uh, one of the problems, and I'll try to make this super short, um, is that even though that's fine, you know, I'm, I'm wrong all the time, and, you know, so a lot of what I studied is no longer considered correct. Maybe you have to revise your thinking. That being said, the old way explained the anatomy better. So even though this new classification scheme is far more consistent with the genetic analysis. Um, to you know, my humble you know, opinion and my poor ability to understand nature, um, <laughs> it just doesn't make sense. And, and so uh, here are some of, of the problems. Um, uh, if uh, you were then to ask, all right, in this new uh, uh, classification, where uh, do uh, traits uh, evolve? Um, and so did the last common ancestor of the protostomes, which are over here, talk about that later, and the deuterostomes over here, did they have a brain and a nerve cord? Well, see, the question then in essence is this. Um, if brains are commonly shared uh, features, if all of these have a brain and then all of these don't, you could argue you know, in here, um, then that means that it evolved at the base of a family uh, tree, so that the common ancestor evolved a trait, and that got passed down to all of the next uh, you know, generation. Now, you could uh, look at, say, a brain you know, and study it anatomically. Um, maybe, however, uh, the reality is that uh, you know, nerve cells clump together differently, so you could even study then the genes and ask, are the genes the same? So let me ask this question with hearts. Among the animals, who has a heart? Well, certainly the vertebrates do, or there's a shark heart, there's a, uh, a fish heart, you know, and um, here. But here's a Drosophila heart and a fruit fly. Now it's a little different. It's an open circulatory uh, system uh, so that uh, uh, the uh, blood vessels uh, then end and then the fluid then goes into like the, um, uh, the body cavity, the coelom, uh, and so therefore the fluid doesn't always stay in blood vessels. Uh, it can then mix with body fluid in the coelom. It's what's called an open circulatory uh, system. Um, notice that the fruit fly and the, uh, the crayfish, they have their hearts on the back. That's important in a second. Uh, here are earthworm hearts. A heart, by definition, is simply 
contractile blood vessels, which uh, pump um, uh, which pump blood. Here's a, a bivalve heart. So in, once again, the old classification, one could say, um, well, we don't have, you know, the flatworms, they don't even have a circulatory system. The nematode worms don't have a circulatory system, um, but most of these then do. So circulatory systems may have evolved around here, hearts somewhere in here, and that's why all of these uh, ones have a heart and the other ones don't. Now that we uh, revise this, it doesn't seem to make sense because now in each of the clades, some of them have hearts and some of them don't, all right? So uh, arthropods have hearts, but their cousins, the nematode, and by cousins, I mean in this classification, their cousins don't even have a circulatory system. Um, annelids and mollusks have hearts, but flatworms, their cousins uh, don't. Um, and so the hearts, they seem to match because when a vertebrate embryo makes a heart and says, put a heart here, it's using a gene, which is the same gene as what a fruit fly uses. And so if this is correct, this is what you know, genetic uh, sequence comparisons suggest, that means either A, that hearts evolved three different times using the same genes, that's not very likely, um, or that hearts evolved down here and that these all kept the ancestral heart, but then uh, these other things lost their hearts. So they once had a circulatory system, which obviously has advantages, and then they lost it in group after group. All right. And that ends up being the same thing you know, that pops up uh, in a few other things. So let me you know, sum up quickly. You could ask, where do segments come from? All right. So obviously, you can see that many bodies have repeating uh, segments. Uh, well, once again, if we get to our family tree, in the old way, the higher animals evolved segments, and that's why things from arthropods to uh, vertebrates and you know early mollusks had segments. But now in the new way, some of them have segments and some don't. Now, maybe segments evolve separately, but vertebrate embryos use some of the same genes to establish a segment that say arthropod videos. Uh, I'm sorry, arthropod embryos do. And so that would seem to suggest that the ancestor of the segmented animals had segments and all segmented animals had inherited traits from those. But then why did they lose their segments and they lose their segments and have no trace uh, of them? Um, uh, we could go through the same with limbs. Now, I know it sounds weird to talk about limbs uh, with worms, for example. Uh, worms don't have limbs, but they can have what are called parapodia. They can have these little extensions. So it's not really a leg. Um, uh, maybe there's a respiratory structure you know, there, but they can use these to like scooch along. Um, and so therefore, uh, even worms can have these repeating you know, outgrowths from the body wall. And some of the genes which establish that are then not only genes that the worms use for these parapodia, but also which are, here's uh, a worm, and then see those little things here, these are parapodia. Um, the uh, um, arthropods use these genes for their limbs, and uh, then so do vertebrates. Okay, so I could go on, and the people I work with know that usually when I go on, I get far more animated, so we should cut this out. Um, the old way could be wrong, and certainly that's what most biologists have currently accepted, that the former classification was wrong. Um, but the new way doesn't make sense. So it may be consistent with the genetic data that this is how life is grouped. But when you look at the anatomical uh, traits, they no longer distribute um, in as understandable a fashion. Uh, so did... Uh, Anatomical structures evolve multiple times using similar or the same genes. That's not what one would predict. But in the same way, did ancestral animals get these great traits like limbs and segmentation and um, cardiovascular systems and then lose them in nematodes and flatworms? That doesn't seem to make sense. So um, what we should do is then you know, put these biological groups into to better pictures. Um, but the data is still coming in. And, and in essence, this is frustrating. It's frustrating for me. It's frustrating for a student. But then, you know, in reality, perhaps this is a perfect illustration of what science should be. We don't know all the answers. We are going to continue to learn. We may have to revise much of what we've already known. And if you're going to be a scientific student, 
um, then that just goes with it, all right? Science is not, here are the facts, memorize them, spit them back. That's not what science is. The science, you know, science is asking questions, even if that means revising, you know, things from the past. One other feature before we start getting uh, into uh, the, uh, uh, the, the groups is what's called a coelom. Um, I'm hollow on the inside, all right? So if you were to, you know, crack open my chest, you know, say in, in a heart surgery, my heart isn't stuck to my lungs and my lungs aren't stuck uh, to uh, the body wall. They're in spaces, all right? There's a pericardial cavity. There's a pleural cavity around the lungs. There's a thoracic cavity. There's an abdominal pelvic cavity. So um, my organs are hung in a space. I'm not solid. Neither is a bug or a mollusk. We have what are called body cavities, which we call coeloms, all right? Now, um, once again, maybe this coelom could be used as a trait to classify animals which have coeloms versus not. So sponges, cnidarians, flatworms, nematodes, they don't have coeloms, um, but then some, uh, but then all, you know, other animals uh, do. Um, so maybe that unites them. However, coeloms, these body cavities do form in different ways. And so protostomes, they have, that would be like arthropods, mollusks, earthworms, um, they form their coelom one way. And then we vertebrates, along with like starfish um, and primitive chordates, we form our coelom uh, a different uh, way, all right? Um, but then uh, we could then even split, you know, talk about a, a false coelom or a pseudo coelom. Um, and so body cavities, as you can see in this chordate, look, here's the digestive tract. Notice it's not stuck to the, um, the body wall. Here in this earthworm, notice that there's a space here for this fluid to go around. So uh, animals don't have to be uh, uh, solid. So um, all of the animals which we're about um, uh, to see, are almost all of them, are coelomates in that they have a body cavity. But once again, if we're gonna get into the weeds on classification, um, we could then distinguish between different kinds of coeloms and ask if they form uh, different uh, ways, uh, or we could ask the question, did some of these groups once have a coelom and then lose it? So um, in, you know, the classes that I teach, we break things into groups and we say, oh, here's the evidence that supports that mammals are a group or primates are a group. And I just wanted to be, you know, quite honest that there has been a revision in the grouping of invertebrates. Um, and there's still some problems with it. So even though now we say this seems to be the grouping which is uh, supported, then that raises more questions which you know, aren't you know, easy to answer. So with that behind, um, I just wanted to say that in the previous video, I talked about flatworms, all right? And now I'd like to talk about a few other you know, uh, uh, invertebrate groups, including these worms, which are called nematodes. Now, just a couple of things that a non-biologist might not automatically know. First of all, even though we use a, a name worm, that doesn't mean worms are a group or related. Worms, have, you know, worms form all of these various groups which have nothing to do with each other. Flatworms are not related to nematodes. Those are round worms. But then earthworms, they're segmented worms. And then there's other groups of worms that aren't as common, and they're not cousins. All right, and so just because something is a worm doesn't mean it's related to another worm. Also, this nematode is microscopic. That strikes people as odd. When people think of animals, um, they're typically thinking of big things. Um, but lots of animals are microscopic. In fact, nematodes seem to be the second most abundant group of animals on Earth in terms of species, um, maybe even first. They might even surpass the arthropods. So. Um, many people don't even know nematodes exist, but they're the second most common type of animal in, in terms of number of species. And the soil that you walk on has, you know, lots of nematodes um, uh, in it. Um, so uh, they're different from, say, segmented worms, like earthworms. Earthworms will have two layers of muscle here. Uh, nematodes only have uh, one, so they aren't quite as flexible as, say, an earthworm would be. They have kind of like a coelom, but not what we consider a true coelom. So sometimes the word coelo, uh, pseudo coelomate is uh, used uh, with them. And then they do lots of things. So they live in the soil um, and they're predators on a lot of even smaller things. So, you know, things like amoebas, 
and you know very small animals. Um, uh, algae uh, can be preyed on by them. Here are the eggs uh, in them. And so nematodes can have a diversity of uh, ecological uh, roles. But they can also then be parasites, all right? So I know that sounds odd that, you know, uh, we think about once again animals as big things, but many of uh, these uh, smaller animals can be parasites inside the larger ones, especially within the intestine. All right, so a lot of wildlife, so foxes, bears, uh, they can have a nematode um, a parasite. And this then becomes important when we consider how we prepare our food, like this is you know, from this pig, um, because if you know, pigs are living in unsanitary uh, conditions, then they can clearly uh, get a nematode uh, infections uh, and then pass that on to the humans that eat, say, undercooked pork. You know, should we worry about this? Well, here, if you look at um, a nematode, look at all of the eggs which can be inside this female. So there are males and female uh, uh, nematodes. You can tell by the, the hook and the tail for the males. Um, uh, and the, the females uh, are full of eggs. And so if this is an intestinal parasite, then these are uh, then being released in, uh, in feces. Now, obviously, uh, you know, there can be you know, fecal contamination of water that can spread these. But even, for example, if someone say, has a latrine, and I'll get to that in uh, a second, if a fly goes into a latrine, these eggs are so small, they could end up on the fly's legs. And then if someone's preparing a meal, you know, in a hot climate, you know, there are flies buzzing around, the fly could land on food and then pass it on food that way. Now, what you're about to see, this is a little dilapidated, but only a little. Um, I was in the Peace Corps. And when I was in the Peace Corps, I had a latrine uh, for the better part of two years. It, it wasn't quite as falling down in this, um, in this condition. Um, but the latrine was very close to the well. Um, and if you're thinking that, uh, you know, that's odd or that's unusual, um, just the reality is, um, so when I talk to my students, you know, they'll, they'll look at a condition like that, you know, like latrines and latrines near, you know, wells, et cetera, and they think of that as a really odd condition. But the reality is, I tell my students, you're the odd ones, all right? You think you're normal, you're just not. So if we were to take, say, 7 billion people, so 7 billion people on the, on the planet, and ask what type of sanitation do they uh, use? Um, well, if you were to consider that type of toilet as normal, or you know, this type of you know, toilet over, say, a hole in the ground, you have a cement slab with a hole, you know, maybe some sort of enclosure, or even something that looks like this without that top uh, uh, enclosure. All of these would fit in the category of improved sanitation that four-sevenths on average of humanity has. So approaching half of humanity, you know, three billion, don't have this. So for some people, you know, some of my students, for example, they would say, ah, oh, you know, oh, that's so primitive, that's so primitive. Um, actually, almost half of humanity doesn't have um, uh, this, where two sevens, all right, would um, uh, have, um, uh, uh, would be lacking improved sanitation, and then one seven would practice open defecation. And then the problem with that, uh, among others, is the number of infections which can then be easily spread. So obviously diarrhea, and you know, uh, previously I've talked about bacteria and protists like amoebas. You know, there are certainly lots of different organisms which can cause diarrhea. But here, when you look at say nematode uh, infections, soil contaminated uh, with feces helps to spread a variety of nematode infections. And about 2 billion people currently have them. I had worms when I lived abroad. And my students were like, oh, that's weird. No, that's actually, you know, close to normal. All right, having parasitic worms has been a normal condition of uh, humanity. And it affects billions of people and can cause hundreds of thousands, um, if not millions of deaths uh, per year. And so... Um, these are just nematodes. Flatworms like tapeworms and flukes affect uh, uh, more individuals as well. So the point is, as we go through these different kinds of worms, um, not only do just general biologists 
you know, uh, you know, have an interest in these, but also doctors. All right, now, it, you know, a doctor practicing in, you know, a, you know, uh, you know, a big city and, in, in, uh, you know, uh, you know, a country state like the United States um, might not need as many of these. They should, A, be exposed to them because, you know, patients can come from anywhere or travel from anywhere. Um, but many individuals then, you know, go abroad. I was in the Peace Corps. Many doctors will, you know, uh, practice medicine in other areas. And so these worms uh, include intestinal parasites, which are one of the major um, factors affecting uh, uh, human uh, health. And so uh, lots of people, uh, therefore, really need to study their uh, worms, um, not for purely biological reasons, but for health reasons. If you want to help your patient, if you want to help your school children learn, well, you have to get rid of their nematode um, intestinal parasites first, or else they're exhausted because all their, you know, a lot of their nutrients are going to um, uh, they're, they're parasites, they don't have attention, you know, et cetera. So, you know, once again, so even if you're a teacher worrying about the parasites of your, um, uh, of uh, your students is important. Okay, so um, here is it, that was uh, an uh, introduction into uh, nematodes. Um, populations of nematodes can reach about a million per square meter, say in soil or uh, water. Um, there are tiny, tiny nematodes. There are nematodes which are, you know, a hundred times or even, you know, close to a thousand times bigger than the small ones. Uh, and so nematodes vary a great deal. And these uh, videos here are, I live in the Northeast United States, um, and this is just pond water. So a lot of people don't take the opportunity to take pond water and look under the microscope. Um, but when they do, uh, you know, you will find a lot of these uh, nematodes, these round uh, worms. Um, and so um, uh, here's a, a group of invertebrates that a lot of people don't know very much about, but nevertheless, they are either the first or second most species rich uh, group of uh, animals on the planet. Uh, they are a major uh, effect on uh, human uh, health. And if you're going to study, you know, food chains, they eat smaller things, bigger animals eat them. And so they're certainly uh, important in uh, food chains. And so, you know, there's a reason to have an appreciation of nematode worms. A um, couple other uh, groups. Another uh, group of microscopic or near microscopic animals are called the rotifers. They have this um, ciliary structure, uh, which allows them to filter a lot of water. So here's a little animal. Right, uh, it's under a microscope. So once again, I, I know that sounds odd that some animals are microscopic, um, but they are. And this rotifer is now sucking in a lot of water with the idea that in this water, there are blue-green algae, there are green algae, there are amoebas and paramecia. So just like we you know, ingest, say, smaller animals as food, this is a predator. Obviously, all animals are getting their nutrition from other living things. And by cycling lots of water, it can then filter feed um, the, uh, uh, the living organisms out of that and thus make uh, its uh, living. Um, so once again, you know, maybe you're approaching this like, oh, I love animals, but I don't care about these. I care about fish. Fine, you know, nothing wrong with that. Um, but what do fish eat? All right, so big fish, big little fish, what do the little fish eat? Well, the little fish are then eating, you know, little animals like, you know, aquatic insects and the like. What do the aquatic insects eat? They're eating even smaller uh, things like, you know, for example, rotifers. And now rotifers are eating, you know, bacteria and, you know, protists and algae. Um, and so, uh, even if you have a favorite group of animals and this group isn't it. Nevertheless, in uh, nature, we have these food chains where these living things depend on each other. I'm sorry, that is you know, video stolen. Um, uh, but, uh, and, and so rotifers are parts of, uh, uh, of a food chain. So here you see uh, this uh, little uh, rotifer swimming about. Some can anchor themselves. Um, uh, with uh, a stalk. And once again, this is a, a local um, rotifer in that if you were to just go to a pond near you, 
and to you know get you know a drop of pond water and look at it under the microscope, then you would find uh, road occurs um, uh, in an area near you. That one was interesting because it's actually swimming around uh, in kind of a gelatinous uh, uh, secretion. Um, and then there's uh, other worms uh, which are called anilids, and they include uh, obviously earthworms we know, and then a few other groups that I'll uh, uh, I'll mention. Now, uh, this is an easy point uh, to uh, recognize that most invertebrates have what's called a complete digestive system. Food comes in one end, the mouth, and it leaves the other end, the anus. Flatworms didn't. Remember, so flatworms have a central opening, um, just like jellyfish do. Food comes in this way and waste comes out. It goes out that way. And so here you can see a complete digestive system. And then what some animals do with their complete digestive system is they specialize different parts of it, all right? So here, earthworms have, you know, they suck in dirt, all right? Um, they will, uh, the pharynx creates suction. They, you know, adjust the pH here. Uh, and then the crop and the gizzard then grind the ingested material so that now the enzymes of the intestine uh, are now able uh, to extract, you know, uh, nutrients uh, from it. All right, so um, earthworms or segmented worms, uh, they have a complete digestive system. Um, among invertebrates, there's lots of different ways to reproduce. Um, some I can reproduce both asexually and sexually. Um, here's just a, a sample of earthworms and how they uh, reproduce uh, as an example. So earthworms are hermaphrodites. They have both testes, which produce sperm, and ovaries, which produce ova. And when they mate, the um, each partner passes its sperm onto uh, uh, to its partner, and then the sperm are held in uh, receptacles. And so then each partner then receives sperm from uh, the other individual. And then the fat part of the earthworm called the clitellum makes this mucus cocoon. And then as it passes over uh, the uh, cranial part of the earthworm, it not only gathers uh, the uh, ova from the ovaries, but also the sperm uh, from the partner held in uh, receptacles. Uh, and then fertilization uh, occurs, and then uh, young earthworms uh, result. And so among these invertebrates, like in nematodes, you can have separate males and females, um, but then there are also scenarios where you can have hermaphrodites. Um, hermaphrodites can be capable of fertilizing themselves uh, or not. They can be self-sterile. So there's all of these variations in, um, uh, in uh, reproduction. Um, so uh, uh, earthworms are segmented worms. Now that's a big advance having segments. I mean, we vertebrates think so, because if you look at our, you know, our vertebrae and our ribs, you know, here's one, there's another, there's another, there's muscles between this rib, muscles between those ribs. So a way of making a more complex body is to, um, uh, to just kind of repeat a pattern of develop, uh, develop. We vertebrates have segments, um, arthropods have segments, earthworms have segments. So that was a big, uh, advanced. Lots of animals achieve complexity in large part because they have these uh, repeating uh, segments. So earthworms are annelid worms, segmented worms, um, and that's different from the nematodes, which are unsegmented, and different from flatworms, which are unsegmented and flat. Now the annelids not only include earthworms, but also leeches. I'll get back uh, to those. Um, but then there's a whole bunch of other uh, segmented worms in annelids as well. Some are much smaller, and once again, you would see under a uh, microscope. Um, so here you can notice uh, the segments on uh, this uh, microscopic, uh, you know, worm that once again you could find in a pond uh, near you. So once again, I apologize. You know, using Zoom and internet videos. Um, they can slow each other down, so I apologize. Uh, these individual, um, you know, videos obviously would play through with the animation. Uh, leeches are segmented worms, and their lifestyles can um, uh, can vary. Some are carnivores, and they hunt small animals, and then some are what are called ectoparasites, so they can uh, latch onto your skin, uh, make an incision, and then suck blood out. Now, one of the things they can secrete in 
uh, at the site of the wound is an anticoagulant because obviously if they're feeding on blood, they don't want the blood to clot because that would end uh, you know, the, the blood coming. So if you've ever had a leech on you and then you take it off, you may notice that it bleeds uh, more profusely than a typical wound. And the, and the reason for that is because the leech secreted an anticoagulant. Um, now, among other things, some leeches are actually very good parents because, you know, here's all these young leeches attached to the parent, and now the parent is in search of its next meal. So let's say it's searching for, um, uh, let's say it's searching for, say, a snapping turtle that it's going to attach to. Well, once it then attaches to the snapping turtle, uh, then all of the young have just been delivered to a place where now they can begin to feed as well. So this uh, leech you know, is actually, you know, uh, showing, you know, a form of parental care. So, you know, obviously invertebrates are, you know, capable of, you know, uh, a large number of diverse um, uh, lifestyles. So annelid worms, they include not only earthworms, which are helping to decompose nutrients in the soil, um, but they include leeches and oligochetes, which can be, you know, predators. Um, but then uh, they also, um, include leeches which can be then parasites and so there's great diversity in the uh in the annelid worms uh, so then uh, let's get to mollusks mollusks are a really successful uh, group of organisms which include snails clams oysters um, but then also octopi and squid so mollusks are a big diverse group um here's a slug which is essentially the same thing as a snail that doesn't make a shell there are sl uh, slugs on land, um, and then also in a marine uh, environments. And so uh, these types of organisms uh, can make a shell or not. Most of them are aquatic, um, but they have ventured out onto land, as in slugs and uh, snails. It is a little more difficult for them on land, so they have to secrete you know, a layer of slime that then they can glide uh, over. Um, and in these videos I'll go into, they can have different types of, you know, uh, you know uh, pro uh, pro uh, processes where you know, their eyes can be located on eye stalks and they can have other uh, ones which are sensory and help them, um, uh, you know, find uh, food and you can, uh, uh, and, and you can see, uh, you know, they're uh, testing their uh, environment. Um, snails have actually twisted their body inside of their shell. And so now they're uh, the end and then the end of their body and then the anus, the end of the digestive system is actually now close to the head. So one of the things they have to worry about is not to be feeding and excreting at uh, the same uh, time. Now, snails are very important. They're important in freshwater uh, food chains. Um, and sometimes they can get to be, you know, agricultural pests, so snails in a garden or uh, snails in aquatic food environments, um, but snails can also then be carriers for things like uh, parasitic flatworms, like flukes. And so therefore, um, snails, for example, let's say you have rice paddies where rice is being grown in stagnant water. Well, the snails which are in the stagnant water can then have fluke parasites, which then go from the snails to, uh, uh, to humans. So once again, not only are snails interesting of themselves, they're interesting uh, when it comes to uh, food chains, um, uh, but then also uh, human health. Uh, snails uh, can also um, uh, be uh, uh, important. As snails uh, go along, uh, they're ingesting uh, lots of you know, smaller items. So you know, if they're ingesting algae, then they're essentially being a herbivore, but they're also ingesting small animals uh, as uh, well. They're recycling uh, uh, nutrients. Um, uh, and so snails can have a diversity of things in uh, their uh, diets. Um, uh, clams and uh, uh, oysters, et cetera, they are bivalves. They are mollusks with uh, two uh, separate uh, hands. Um, so snails have one part of uh, their shell, uh, whereas another group of mollusks then have two. Um, uh, the molluscan shell is secreted by tissue known as the mantle. So here's the mantle which secretes the shell. Once again, bivalves have two hands. Now what is a clam all about? 
Um, well, clams have this muscular foot, which helps them burrow into the sediment where they are. Um, but then they have gills. And then the idea is that um, clams suck water in through one opening, one siphon, and then uh, water leads through a different siphon. And as water then circulates through uh, the body, uh, then uh, not only can they get oxygen from it, so water passes over the gills, um, but then this is also bringing in food because there's you know, bacteria, protists, algae in the, um, uh, in, uh, the water that then they can then catch in uh, mucus and then they have cilia, which can sweep this towards the mouth. They have a mouth and then into their digestive uh, tract. Um, also, when they reproduce, this water that's flowing through them uh, can then be used to release their gametes as well. So clams set up a movement of water. See, water comes in uh, these uh, uh, spaces here. These ostium will then flow into water tubes and then go out. And this movement of water is then also the basis for them bringing food in because they're filter feeding uh, from uh, the water around them, uh, and then also, uh, you know, excreting waste and producing uh, gametes. Uh, so a lot of the bivalves live in uh, the ocean. You know, so there are clams and oysters and scallops uh, and mussels, etc. Um, but they can be fresh water uh, as uh, well. Um, and so if you know you were say in the Delaware River, you'd see plenty of clams there. Um, there are very small uh, clams, uh, and some of them are actually endangered. So we have to worry about, you know, not washing off our boats and bringing in foreign invasive uh, freshwater mussels and clams, which then um, uh, threaten the native uh, uh, populations. Another group of uh, mollusks includes octopi and squid and is known as the cephalopods. So here we see a cuttlefish, also in this group, and the foot, which um, as snails glide on and which mussels can then um, use to burrow, here has been split into separate uh, tentacles, which we, can be used for uh, food uh, capture. Uh, so the foot can then help to uh, trap prey and then bring it towards uh, the, uh, the mouth. Um, now, uh, mollusks uh, make shells, although these shells can vary. The first mollusks and some primitive mollusks alive today, they have segmented shells, showing they're connected to segmented worms. Um, but even then among squid uh, and early cephalopods, the, most groups were shelled and they were extremely common in uh, the fossil era, but some of the mass extinctions hit them very hard. Some could even get to be 30 feet long. Um, there are still uh, cephalopods today which have this shell. So the nautilus is a shelled um, cephalopod uh, uh, today, uh, but this was once the dominant group of cephalopods. Uh, today, the squid and the octopi um, primarily don't have those shells with the exception of uh, the nautilus. Um, so there are nautilus uh, shells uh, there. Um, you know, these cephalopods are amazing because, you know, they include giant octopi and giant squid. Um, these would be the largest and most complex eyes in invertebrates. They would have the largest and most complex brains in uh, invertebrates. So when it comes to um, invertebrates, here's say this octopus. Um, you know, octopi, they're you know, capable of, of learning in ways that uh, uh, other invertebrates often aren't. And so many you know, people, if you've seen you know, the, the Finding Nemo uh, you know, sequel, Finding Dory, or if you, you know, are familiar with aquariums, I mean, there are cases where octopi actually will come out of one tank and crawl across the floor, go into another tank, eat everything that's there, and then crawl um, back in their uh, first um, uh, tank. And then, you know, the people who, who manage the aquarium come in and say, where did all the fish go? Um, so uh, octopi uh, and uh, squid are actually quite uh, smart. And so I'm sorry, this is glitching uh, here, but you can see, uh, you know, when I was scuba diving, here's an octopus. Uh, moving uh, in its, uh, you know, and then going into a, uh, a crevice. So um, there are all of these groups of invertebrates. Now, uh, the next video, we'll look at arthropods, the most successful group of animals uh, on uh, Earth. Um, but then just, I want to just mention, I've skipped a lot. So, you know, this was, uh, you know, kind of an overview of 
you know, a bunch of invertebrate uh, groups. But if you were a biologist who studies uh, invertebrates, then there's all of these minor groups. They don't get a lot of attention. Um, but just, I, I just want to give two examples. So for example, there are more worms other than the flatworms, the round worms, and the segmented annelid worms that I've mentioned. So there's a lot of worms, including these preopulid worms here. Um, there are still uh, some left today, but if you go back to when, you know, animals really got their big start, say 500 million years ago, they were major predators in uh, the Cambrian uh, uh, period. There are um, animals known as brachiopods and bryozoans, which have a, uh, a specialized uh, lophophore uh, structure. Brachiopods look like clams, but they're not. They aren't that common today. Um, but once again, going back to the Paleozoic era, brachiopods were the dominant shellfish, and then clams and oysters, they come later. There was another group called the bryozoans. Once again, in the Paleozoic, they were you know, major uh, groups of invertebrates. Here's a microscopic view with that low before uh, structure um, uh, uh, for uh, feeding. Um, now, once again, they're not as common today, but we can still find them in ocean environments. Um, but then here's a, a colony of freshwater bryozoans uh, as well. Um, and so uh, uh, some of the groups of invertebrates are minor and perhaps have never been all that common, uh, but some are minor today, but were very important in uh, the fossil uh, record. And you know, today's uh, representatives are the last living members of a much more successful group. So this has been the second in the series of videos of invertebrate uh, diversity, just trying to introduce um, you know, uh, students to the, uh, the great variety of invertebrates uh, that there are and some of the features of the various groups.